Dr. Bernie Dodge, creator of the WebQuest model, explains common WebQuest design pitfalls. I know there are tens of thousands of WebQuests out there, and some are better than others. Where do people go wrong in creating a WebQuest? Well, you're right. If you do a Google search on the word WebQuest, uh, last time I checked, there were over 3 million hits. Uh, it doesn't mean there are 3 million WebQuests, and it certainly doesn't mean there are 3 million good WebQuests. But if you search, you'll see that there is a wide range of uh, quality, I guess primarily because, as far as we know, they've all been written by humans and, uh, and all the variability that comes with that. I would say there's, there's a, a, a small number of pitfalls to look out for, and the first is just choosing an inappropriate topic for a web quest. I would never recommend that everything be treated with a web quest, so you have to make sure that what you select is, um, is appropriate for the web quest format. Uh, and the other sort of major category of problems or pitfalls is creating a task that's inauthentic. Um, so let me just talk a little bit more about, about that. The kinds of topics that shouldn't be taught with a web quest, I think, uh, our procedures. Uh, it may be hard to teach the Pythagorean theorem, um, and it's also hard and not interesting to complete your income taxes, but it's really just a set of steps, procedures, with uh, not much creativity or, or open-endedness to it. That would not be a good thing to, to put into the WebQuest format. Uh, information that is primarily about factual recall. I've seen a WebQuest, I've seen several, unfortunately, in which uh, what teachers were trying to teach was the 50 state birds in capitals. Uh, there are other ways to teach that. The WebQuest uh, format is not appropriate for that. I think I would also avoid topics where, uh, the, where the content is already very well covered by the textbook you already have and instead look for topics that are informed or improved by taking advantage of the web with its colorfulness and craziness. Um, and the ability to get obscure kinds of references and, and information that wouldn't ever be in your textbook or your school library. Uh, and things that are very topical, very right up to date. You know, look for a topic that, that, uh, that um, requires the currency of the web and avoid those that can get by just fine without that. Um, and I don't know what the opposite of multifaceted is, let's call it single faceted. But, but some things really have, are not open to interpretation. You know, web quests are best when there's differences of opinion, there's different ways to look at something, when there's, no, there's more than one possible right answer. And so those are the kinds of things that you want to pick and avoid the others. Uh, and then finally, inauthentic tasks. And by that I mean those things that only happen in schools or universities. Um, we, we constantly inflict assignments on kids that adults just don't do. I can't remember the last time I had to write a three-page essay about anything. It was some time ago, and I was probably in a class somewhere. Uh, I think we're better off using the web to, to um, give kids practice at doing scaled-down versions of things that adults do, and, and things that have that kind of authenticity. But university faculty in particular often go with what's familiar and they create, they use the WebQuest format to create uh, essentially what is a research a research paper kind of assignment. And though you can do that, I think it's just not in the spirit of what a WebQuest is supposed to be. Well, how can you, how can WebQuest authors, I should say, avoid that research paper pitfall? I think, you know, I used to be a math teacher. I know I used to be a math teacher. And, I, and the, one of the most common questions that bedevil math teachers is, when are we going to use this? And I think that's a good question to ask yourself. Uh, we all love our, our, our content area. We, we love the domain usually a lot more than our students do. And um, we get caught up in teaching, teaching it in the way that we, uh, we, we have it arranged in our own minds and forgetting why it is that we have to, have to teach these things. So for what, whatever your topic is, I think it's useful to step back and say, when does somebody actually need to know this stuff and how do they apply that knowledge to some other kind of situation? And, uh, and if you can do that, then I think you're on the way towards creating more authentic kinds of tasks and assignments. So what are some examples of tasks that require higher level thinking? Well, you know, higher level thinking um, was pretty much defined in the mid-50s by Benjamin Bloom, and his taxonomy has been redefined several times since then. But the basic notion is that uh, higher level thinking is, are, are those things that are at the top of Bloom's, uh, Bloom's building. Uh, analysis, synthesis, evaluation, or creativity, uh, however it's been rephrased. 
But I've got my own taxonomy, and I, and I, and I think it, it, it comes from the fact that I think you can look into any classroom or ask yourself at any given moment in, in your class, what's the dominant verb that's going on here? What is it that you're asking your learners to do? And there are some verbs that only happen in classrooms. Know, tell, remember. And then there's another set of verbs that happens when people are fully using their minds and are getting well paid uh, to, to use their minds and are fully engaged as citizens in an information-rich society. And those verbs, my favorite verbs anyway, are, are decide, design, create, predict, and judge. And if you can create tasks that are wrapped around those verbs, then I think you're, you, you can't do something that's inauthentic and you can't do something that is, that is not relevant to, to the world. Well, how do you know when you've succeeded? I think you know when you've succeeded when the results of your student products are different from each other. Uh, that, that, there is, um, that there is richness in what they write and that every assignment, every product that's turned in is unique and shows the history, the, the, the intellectual baggage that your student came to the table with uh, and shows their individual voice and their individual uh, creativity. Um, the only way that can happen is if the task really was more open-ended and open to, open to uh, learners making their mark on it. So I think one way to know that you've succeeded is if, if the range of output that you get from your students is better than it used to be, and if the depth of the kinds of issues they, they bring up is better than when you treated the, that, that topic um, in, a, in a more traditional way.